the gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. Sarah Howarth, welcome back to the Titans of Nuclear podcast. Today I am here with Brian Van Gore, who is the author of Images of America's Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant. Brian, thank you so much for being on the show. We're lucky to have you here with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be on the show. Of course. Mm. And so let's just start off with a little bit about your background. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Yonkers, New York. Mm-hmm. And um, went to a, a high school there called Saunders, which was a trading technical high school. Uh, wasn't like a normal high school like Yonkers High or Roosevelt or Lincoln. Uh, we had the choice of taking an academic curriculum or a trade curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I chose machine design. So for three years, um, I spent a lot of time in machine shop, a lot of time breaking metals apart, and a lot of time drafting. So it was the whole the whole curriculum was geared to you becoming a mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. And how did mechanics kind of lead you eventually to becoming interested in nuclear? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, I really didn't become interested in nuclear mm -hmm. um, until I started working at Indian Point. Believe it or not, <laughs> my my uh, I, I graduated from Manhattan College in 1979 uh, with a mechanical engineering degree and. My whole Saunders senior class, all seven of us in machine design, ended up in Manhattan College with mechanical engineering degrees. And so we all went in the same direction. Mm -hmm. um, when I graduated, I went to work for uh, American Electric Power in New York City, in Manhattan, um, in uh, materials handling. When I got there, I found that they were planning on moving to Ohio. Wow. And so, and, and, and everybody there was looking for a job. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in the wrong place to start off with. So one day, uh, one of my fellow engineers walks into my office and throws a piece of paper on my desk and it said, nuclear power shift advisors wanted at a nuclear power plant 30 miles north of New York City. Mm -hmm. So that was like the first thing I thought of Indian Point. I knew it was Indian Point. It didn't say the name of the plant, but we all knew it was Indian Point. Right. And this was um, right after Three Mile Island. Mm -hmm. So Three Mile Island happened on March 28, 1979, and many, many things came out of that event at Three Mile Island. The NRC issued thousands of regulations, new regulations that had to be followed by nuclear power plants uh, with all certain due dates, and one of them was to have a shift technical advisor. Okay. That would, that would be a degreed person who would be in, in or around the control room around the clock. Mm -hmm. So one of the th things they learned from Three Mile Island was the control room operators didn't necessarily understand all the thermodynamics behind what was going on in the plant. Uh, up to that time in the 70s, most nuclear plant control rooms were manned by uh, ex-Navy personnel from aircraft carriers and submarines. Okay. Usually no degrees. Mm -hmm. So the NRC thought it would be a good idea to have a degreed person on shift around the clock. Um, as, as one of the requirements. So they, they issued two large volumes of documents, uh, requirements, NUREG 0737 and NUREG 0578. And in NUREG 0578, it required the shift technical advisor. So I was hired in the first group of shift technical advisors at Indian Point 3. Okay. So that's a pretty contentious time to, you know, go into the nuclear industry. Did you have any initial skepticism to overcome or were you just all about getting involved? Oh, no, I, I had no skepticism. Um, 
In fact, I talked a little bit about that in my interview, but I had I had no skepticism. I wanted to learn something, and uh -huh. it seemed uh, very, nuclear power seemed very exciting. Um, the one thing we did have to overcome was our acceptance into the plant. When we got there, we're, we're brand new engineers. We really had no idea how the plant worked. And here we are walking into the control room, talking to these operators who have been doing this for years, virtually. Mm -hmm. uh, so we weren't well accepted in the beginning. It took a, little, took a few years for us to become part of the group, but we did. Yeah, that's great. In the book, you talk a lot about how close the community really was there and how it was kind of like a family. Oh, it definitely was like a family. You, you spend 30 years or 35 years in that control room with the same people um, and the same people outside the control room. You definitely become a family. That's our second home was our home away from home. Right. Yeah. So kind of talking a little bit about your book now, what's the piece all about? What inspired you to write it? Um, well, I, I I was the town historian here where I live in Carmel, New York, for five years, and um, about ten years ago, I helped with the the book, the Arcadia Images of America book on my town, Manhattan, New York, or Mahopac, New York. So I was a little bit used to working on these books from Arcadia Publishing, um, and then I just got the idea from a friend who knew that I had all these photographs and all this all these years at the plant and suggested that I work on one of these Arcadia books uh, on Indian Point. And I, I applied. And after going through their board of editors, they decided to go through with the book. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I wrote the book for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted the people who worked at the plant to have something to hold on to in the future to, to remind them of, of what they, of the job, the amazing job that they did at the plant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they something they could have and, and and look at and remember. I wanted to commemorate the plant itself. It was an amazing mechanical achievement and, and engineering achievement. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted, you know, people who were non-nuclear to be able to pick this book up and learn something about the plant and see how hard we worked to make that plant as safe as it possibly could be. Yeah, absolutely. So you have a historian background. Can you give us a kind of historical snapshot of what, you know, a typical day or a day of your choosing looked like at Indian Point in maybe the 1950s or 60s or any point during your career there? Well, it was um, it was an amusement park up until 1956. Mm -hmm. So Indian Point Park opened up in 1923. Um, this June 26th will be the 100th anniversary of the opening of Indian Point Park, which was a, a pleasure park with uh, mostly with walking trails and picnic grounds and playgrounds and things like that. It didn't have rides and amusements till later on. Mm -hmm. But that closed in uh, 1956 and the property was sold to uh, Con Edison, who built Indian Point One, which started operating in 1962 mm -hmm. and ran until 1974. And then they started building Indian Point 2 and 3 in 1966 and 1968, respectively. Uh, Indian Point 2 started up in 1974 and Indian Point, in, Indian Point 3 in 1976. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as myself, I started I started 43 years ago, uh, three days ago. Oh, wow. March 31st, 1980. And um, I spent most of that time... 35 years in the operations department and, and 32 of those years with a senior reactor operator's license. So we spent a lot of time in the control room and whether you came in at 6 a.m. or 6 p.m., it was a long 12 hours in the control room. It was a room with you know no windows and a room you couldn't walk out of and uh, the phone on a day shift, the phone rang constantly and on a night shift, it was pretty boring, <laughs> um, hopefully. And um, on a day shift, lots of people walking in and out uh, maintenance people, instrumentation and control people, uh, lots of tests going on inside the plant. So 12 hours in the control room on a day shift was a very busy time. Um, you look forward to the weekends because less people were there. You look forward to night shifts. <laughs> but it, was, <laughs> it was a very busy time in the control room on a normal day shift mm -hmm. for uh, control room personnel. Yeah. So you mentioned that the plant announced and began its construction in the early 1950s. What was the public's outlook on kind of the whole operation? 
Um, and at the time, the recent passage of the Atomic Energy Act as well. Right. Um, for first time listeners who are learning about nuclear currently and to use the words of Brian in his book, the 1954 act allowed for private peaceful use of the atom. I, I believe that the surrounding community at the time in 1956 was pretty accepting and, and wanting Indian Point One to be constructed. First of all, Westchester County was growing by leaps and bounds and Con Edison was predicting a large increase in the demand for electricity over the next 15, 20 years. So they, were, they needed power plants. And of course the community needed jobs and this was gonna bring in thousands of jobs at, at the time and be a long construction project. Um, I'm not sure how early on they knew that knew about Indian Point two and three, mm -hmm. but even back in the 50s, they talked about building six units. So we know that they built Indian Point two and three. We know they were planning on building plants, I believe, close by in Verplank. And there was also thought about building a nuclear power plant in Queens. Okay. So there were going to be a lot of plants, but I think at the time it was accepted by the community. And it was a big construction project, and not many people knew about nuclear pro and con at that time, I believe. So right. just another construction project, and here's something that sounds pretty neat, a nuclear power plant. Um, I, growing up in Yonkers as a little kid, I remember my dad being um, interested in seeing what this Indian Point One was all about. And we got into our 1961 Ford Fairlane and drove from Yonkers to Buchanan, which was the ends of the earth back then. And I remember being in the visitor center and looking out and seeing the dome of Indian Point One. And uh, thought that was pretty cool as a eight or nine year old. Yeah, that's awesome. And Indian Point did tours throughout its time of being open too, right? For families to come, you yeah. know, explore and learn more. There was, a, there was a visitor center, which really was just removed a few years ago. Um, that you were able to come in and there was a movie and there were brochures and there was a there was a back patio where you could look out onto Indian Point One. Mm -hmm. And then there was a second part of the tour, which I only found out about in the last couple of years, where they took you down into the plant and there was a glass room or an enclosure that you could enter and look out at the control room of Indian Point One and see the operators operating the plant. And I know where that space is today. Um, it's now an office. Mm -hmm. but, um, and I've seen pictures of it. So it was probably a second part of the tour, which I didn't get to go on in, as a young child. Yeah, that sounds like a special experience, though, for sure. And then switching gears a little bit, was Indian Point built on or near Indigenous land? Well, we do know that there were Native American tribes to the north in Peekskill and to the south in Austin. So Indian Point is a made up name. Mm -hmm. um, when they built real quickly the history before Indian Point Park was um, the Hudson River Dayline Company which was the major steamship company from 1861 all the way up into the mid-1900s 1971 in fact mm -hmm. um, they by the 1920s they were having a problem competing with nearby Bear Mountain which was okay. a very popular place to go so hundreds if not thousands of people would get on the boats every morning in New York City Mm -hmm. up the Hudson River, everybody would get off of Bear Mountain and the boats would go up the rest of the river empty. So by the 1920s, they were trying to figure a way to, a way to remediate that. So they, they bought 320 acres south of Peekskill, right on the Hudson River. Mm -hmm. And they figured out, oh, let's, let's come up with a name that's really attractive to the younger passengers. Yeah. So we've got Bear Mountain. Let's make this Indian Point. Sounds, sounds pretty cool. So, uh, but as far as, uh, you know, tribes nearby or, or, North and south of us, not not where we are. Okay, gotcha. Um, I was just curious if there was, you know, a relationship fostered with indigenous people in the area, or you know, if they had a say in how the land was being used, or the fact that a plant would be constructed. But it seems like they kind of maybe weren't close enough to that area. No, they weren't. And okay. uh, again, it was strictly a fabricated name. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So. <laughs> Let's jump into maybe the technical aspect of things for a bit. Um, how many megawatts was Indian Point generating and what other details are important to the history of the plant? Well, Indian Point One was uh, one of a kind. Um, it was a uh, Babcock and Wilcox reactor. It was 60% nuclear and 40% an oil superheater. Mm 
-hmm. So it was, it was really one of a kind plant. It had horizontal steam generators. It was a pressurized water reactor, but the rods came in from the bottom, uh, which was unusual typically of a boiling, uh, for a boiling water reactor. Mm -hmm. um, it only ran for 12 years. It uh, originally had a thorium core, which was called core A. Mm -hmm. And after its first cycle, core A was removed in its entirety and replaced with core B, which was a uranium core. Mm -hmm. So Indian point two and it made 265 megawatts. Okay. Um, Indian point two and Indian point three were, were for the time classic Westinghouse pressurized water reactors, four loop pressurized water reactors. Um, Indian point two was built at, I think, eight, 875 megawatts and Indian point three at 965. They were, they were later upgraded to, um, larger outputs, Indian point three ended up about 1,070 megawatts at the end of its life. But those were typical four loop pressurized water reactors, 15 by 15 Westinghouse fuel assemblies. Um, many of them were built in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And how did this differ at all um, from plants that were built before? Plants that were built before were uh, smaller. Mm -hmm. They were either maybe two loop or three loop plants. The early plants like Connecticut Yankee or, or Yankee, uh, Yankee Row, um, there was a number of them, Dresden. They were smaller plants, uh, different containment buildings, didn't have the large containment buildings. Some of them had a metal sphere, just like Indian Point One did. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were, they were smaller plants. And, and again, uh, there was no standard design. They were all built special. They were all one of a kind. Gotcha. And so in your book, you give kind of a detailed account of the plant layout as well. Can you give us sort of an abbreviated or not <laughs> account of what the layout of the plant looked like? Well, they built, you, normally uh, power plants have, um, nuclear power plants had a control room that was shared between like say two units. Mm -hmm. So the control rooms were like back to back horseshoes, but it wasn't the case at Indian Point. Indian Point one sat between Indian Point two and three. So okay. they, had, they had separate turbine halls and separate control rooms and separate control buildings and separate spent fuel pools and a lot of things that other plants would combine in the point was separate. So um, that led to things later on, but um, it was it was definitely uh, unusual. I visited other plants in my career and it was you know interesting to see a control room back to back and both units in one room. Uh, mm -hmm. where I was so used to Indian Point where I sat in the Unit 3 control room and Unit 2's control room was 800 feet away. Right. So, um, But they did that because, the, I guess, the layout of the land, but they decided to build Indian Point 2 and Indian Point 3 on either side of Indian Point 1. Mm -hmm. And so tell us a little bit more kind of about your time at Indian Point. Did you have, you know, a particular day-to-day -day task that was most intriguing to you or any passion projects or anything like that during your career there? Well, um, like I said, I started in 1980 as a shift technical advisor. And in 1982, they sent myself and my very best friend, Don Vinchkoski. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to college together and we um, both had jobs right out of school we weren't real thrilled with. He went to GE and I went to American Electric Power. So when I got that piece of paper on my desk that day down the city about being a shift technical advisor, I immediately sent it off to Don, who lived much closer to Indian Point than I did. Mm -hmm. And we both started the same day. Oh, wow. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, on March 31st, 1980. Mm -hmm. He is retired now, but we started the same day. And we were both STAs. We were also the first two STAs to go to license school for our senior reactor operator's license in 1982. Mm -hmm. And we finished in 1983. So really in 1983, we went on the watch as licensed operators. And um, we were kind of... Uh, used as special projects people by the operations manager, whatever was going on in the plant as far as an impo visit or an NRC uh, evaluation or procedures need, needing to be revised. We worked on special things like that, didn't spend our entire day in the control room. We were able to float around and work on other projects. So that was very good. The other part of that was Don and I were chosen way early on in the eighties to do refueling, which became our passion. Mm -hmm. So refueling um, is when you shut the plant down every year and a half or two years and you are going to refuel the reactor. So it's quite an evolution taking a reactor apart with a 169 ton reactor vessel head mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and 193 fuel assemblies. But we were we were given that job. We didn't know anything about it. Uh, Westinghouse did the work. Westinghouse was always hired to come back during outages and perform all these large tasks, whether it were fueling, steam generator maintenance, turbine maintenance, uh, reactor vessel head inspections, reactor coolant pump maintenance. They did all that work. But they always had somebody from the company with them to help them along the process because they didn't know the people, they didn't know the plant, they didn't know the processes. So Don and I were assigned to do refueling. Um, when you do refueling in a reactor, uh, there needs to be a senior reactor operator who monitors the core alterations. He must be in direct line of sight or communication with the, with the core alterations. So that was yeah. Don and I. So that was like the late eighties. We were doing our first refueling. And then we did every refueling after that until the plant closed. Mm -hmm. So for like 30 years, we did refueling and that became really our passion. We really look forward to outages. I mean, we spent our entire lives in the control room, 85 to 90% of the time when, when the outages came, we went off and did refueling and it was just a such, such an interesting and fun job to do. Mm -hmm. Moving so the fuel, um, taking the reactor apart, doing reactor disassembly, taking all the fuel out, bringing it over to the fuel building, inspecting it all, and then bringing it all back in. It's just a uh, really interesting job. That's awesome. So you feel like you really learned by doing for the most part. In that, in that case, we certainly did. Um, Westinghouse taught us in the beginning, realized we were young kids with brand new SRO licenses. And, and we learned from there. It took us, it took a number of refuelings to learn, but Mm -hmm. uh, we eventually did. And be, and then we just inherited every refueling after that. There was no question about it, who was doing, who was doing refueling. Right. And was there kind of a mentorship culture that eventually came to be between the people that had been there for a while or been in nuclear for a while and the people like yourself who came in a little bit later? When Don and I arrived at Indian Point, there was, I'll call them this, they'll hate this, but they were old timers. Mm -hmm. And, um, they had either come to Indian Point from Con Edison in the city, most likely Con Edison in the city, and they were near their end of the careers and they had aspired to, to work at Indian Point and they were, and we learned everything from these guys. They, they just knew the plant backwards and forwards. They, wa they watched it get built. They watched it during construction. They did the first refueling. They did the first everything. And they just knew the plant inside and out, backwards and forwards. and you just tried to be like them. And, and we, we really admired these guys and um, they were just great to work for. That's amazing. And do you feel like that's kind of one of the things that was maybe unique to Indian Point and what else really stood out about the plant? Um, that I'm sure that was unique, unique to Indian Point. We had some, what really stood out about the plant was we had some really smart people mm -hmm. and um, they, really set the plant on the right track from the beginning. Um, you know, a lot of things were done over the years. A lot of things were practiced. A lot of procedures were performed. And it all, it all came from these, these, this first group who really started the plant up and set the tone for how the plant would be operating over the decades. Mm -hmm. And you also talked a little bit already about kind of the huge time commitment that this was and, you know, how employees sometimes miss, you know, the soccer games and the birthdays and things like that. What really kept you all going during, you know, those long shifts in your time there? Well, first of all, we love being there. Mm -hmm. So you, you grew to love the job and it wasn't something you could easily walk away from. Um, out of, I mean, not only did we work 12 hour shifts normally in the control room, whether it was 6 a.m. or 6 p.m. Or, or the other way around. But in outages, you typically worked six or seven 12s. So you were there for 30 days sometimes in, in the early days before they had a fatigue rule. But you, know, you could be there for 30 days in a row working 12 hours a shift. And there was only one thing in your brain, and that was just to get this refueling done and get it done right and get it over with. And you didn't think about it. And your family knew this, this was coming and you went home, you went to sleep, you woke up, you ate something, you went back to work. Mm -hmm. But it was just, it wasn't, um, it wasn't something we hated doing. It was something we loved doing. Mm -hmm. uh, refueling, I, I explained this to other younger SROs later in my life. Um, refueling became addictive. Um, you really couldn't wait for it to happen. 
you knew it real well. You couldn't wait for the same Westinghouse guys to come back from Pittsburgh. We had a, a great time and, and we, we ended up with a group that really did the outages very well. Mm -hmm. And are people today still able to visit the grounds of Indian Point or are there any other historical resources other than your book, of course, which is an amazing one to start with? Well, yes, we, we give tours today uh, still um, to people who are interested in coming to the planet to see what's happening now with decommissioning. Mm -hmm. um, we're always open to that. And we, in fact, I have a, we, we do West Point tours. We do local uh, politicians, leaders, local community groups. Everybody has been to the plant uh, in the last couple of years uh, to see what's happening. The um, Buchanan Local History Room, which is in the, in the village of Buchanan, Mm -hmm. uh, has a lot of artifacts and memorabilia and, and photographs of Indian Point over the years, the park and the power plant. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there are, there are things to do and you can visit Indian Point. That's awesome. And then what would you say maybe nuclear now, nuclear today could learn from Indian Point? One, one thing that made Indian Point successful where other plants may have not been so successful in this area uh, Indian Point was not a revolving door. Mm -hmm. People came and stayed for their entire careers. And it made a huge difference. Uh, I know of other plants that are basically people come in, they stay for a couple of years and they leave. They're, they're just not as conducive to staying there, whereas Indian Point was. And so all the people that I worked with over the years, you know, they were there from the 80s. And we all knew how to work together. We all knew what each other was capable of. We knew how to communicate with each other. So operating the plant and performing outages on the plant became much easier when you, everybody knew what each other was doing and everybody got very good at it. So that was one thing. If you can keep people for a long time and make them happy, that works out much better than having a revolving door at your plant. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense for sure. And where is Indian Point at right now in the process of decommissioning? And what will that look like in the future as well? Um, right now, we, so we started decommissioning in the fall of 2021. Mm -hmm. We shut Indian Point 3 down on April 30th, 2021. Uh, we have two major projects going on at Indian Point right now. One is pool to pad. So that's unloading all the fuel assemblies out of both spent fuel pools, Unit 2 and Unit 3. Uh, up at, uh, into dry cast storage and up to the spent fuel pad or the SFISI pad is what it's called, the independent spent fuel storage installation. Um, we finished unit two on February 1st. So we're gonna start unit three in June and we're hoping to be done by the end of the year or in November actually with Indian Point 3. So that, that project should be over by the end of the year. That's the pool to pad project. The other project is vessel segmentation. So that's the cutting up of the reactor coolant systems and the reactor vessels, basically. So they started first with Indian Point 3. They uh, are in the process of completing, the, the, the Unit 3 head is completely cut up and the pieces are being removed right now. It's almost gone, actually. The uh, upper internals package is being cut up and, and most of it is gone. The RCS loops where they connected to the reactor vessel and the steam generators have been cut. So the next big project is, is to get down into the reactor and start working on the, on the core barrel or, or the lower internals and eventually the reactor vessel. So unit three is first in that process. Then they'll go over to unit two. And I think the last thing to come apart will be unit one, which is uh, looks like it might be a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. But those are the two projects, Sarah, vessel segmentation and pool to pad. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And one of the things that kind of gave me chills or really stood out to me when reading through your book was when you mentioned and showed a picture of the fact that some of the people who had been working at Indian Point for such a long time actually signed a part of the plant upon their departure. Can you tell me a little <laughs> bit about that? I thought that was really well, cool. You know, as, as you know, normally we don't write on walls or write on things when the plant was running, but when it came time to uh, start taking the plant apart, you would see names and things popping up. So, um, I think the thing you're referring to is the probably the top of the manipulator crane mast when we took the uh, last fuel out of unit three, which is the last fuel out of any reactor there. So we 
we all signed the top of the mast and even though that that mast is long gone now so um <laughs> but i did take a lot of pictures of it and people added their names over over some time and i did put it in the book yeah and there's other there's other uh, instances of that going on right now <laughs> that's awesome well even though it's gone it'll be forever immortalized in your book so that's fair that's, that's what i'm i'm hoping and especially for the, the people who really worked hard on, at that plant to make it the success that it was mm -hmm. And do you all keep in touch still today after forging what seems like, you know, such a strong bond? We while do. There's, there. there's, a, there's a Friends of Indian Point on Facebook. There's, um, there's retiree luncheons that are held like every month or two. There's one coming up in a few weeks that I'll probably go to. Um, but yes, we do keep in touch with uh, a lot of our friends. And I send out photographs of the decommissioning to hundreds of them mm -hmm. um, pretty regularly. So I'm still, I'm still taking a lot of pictures and a lot of video at the plant. I've been doing that for years and years, and I have quite a collection of tens of thousands of photographs. So um, everybody likes to see that stuff. So we do keep, we do keep in touch. Mm -hmm. And so as Indian Point is kind of, you know, being decommissioned, do you have a vision that you want to share for what the future of nuclear could look like? Well, as, well, as far as Indian Point goes, Indian Point, We'll, we'll be there probably for the next 12 to 15 years. Uh, we're not talking about taking the containment buildings down um, for about 12 years. So they'll be disassembled from the inside and all the reactor cooling system and all the equipment will be slowly cut up and removed from the buildings. But the buildings, the containment buildings will be there for quite some time, as will Indian Point One. Um, there was talk about, you know, Holtec, who is now the owner of Indian Point, is heavily into uh, small modular reactors, which is the way that it seems like the industry is going for the immediate future and seems like the next wave of nuclear power in this country. Um, and they, I'm sure they would love to put a small modular reactor at Indian Point. Whether that, that'll happen or not, I'm not sure. I know they're looking at other places uh, in this country as well. So um, Holtec and other companies are um, heavily investing in small modular reactors. Many of my coworkers are um, seeing the end of their career at the plant and they're going to work for Holtec on small modular reactors. So that seems to be the next wave, SMRs. Uh, whether that'll happen at Indian Point, you know, I'd love to see it in Indian Point four and five, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely have to see. <laughs> and where can people who want to read your book find it? Oh, my book is on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. It's on Target, I think. So it's on any, on a lot of websites, you can just order it. I have it here. You can see the front of it if you want. Yeah, yeah. Let's show it off for all of our YouTube viewers. And if you're <laughs> listening, there's a very cool historical picture on the front. And there's a big kind of sign on the top that says Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant. And do you have a name for the person who is operating on that photo? Well, the, the funny thing about that photo is um, Arcadia wanted six possible cover pictures and um I, I thought an aerial photo would probably be the best but they didn't want an aerial so they wanted something that was old and they wanted something that show, showed a person in it so i always love this picture it's a con edison picture it's the first refueling of indian point one in 1965 and this person here is sitting at the control panels and he's sitting right over the reactor vessel underneath him and he's actually moving fuel using these controls so this, I, I think, is 1965. Um, it took me a while to find out who that was. I, I figured if this is going to be the cover, let me do everything I can find out who that was. So I sent this photo out to every old timer I could think of who worked at Indian Point, especially Indian Point One. And most came back and said, no idea, before my time. But one person, Bill Letmoden, wrote back and said, that looks like Jimmy Oakman to me. So I said, OK, and who's Jimmy Oakman? And he said, he mentioned another employee who I did know, Madeline Noto, who has worked in my era. That's her dad. Oh, wow. So I said, are you kidding me? So I emailed the photograph to Madeline in, in Florida, and she had never seen the picture before. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, oh, my gosh, where did you get that picture of my dad from? And so we have a little bit of a story that um, not only did Jimmy Open work at Indian Point in operations and maintenance, but his daughter, Madeline, worked at the plant for 37 years. Mm -hmm. She married her husband, who worked at the plant, Dan Noto, who worked there also 30 plus years. So the cover has a little bit of a story. 
That's amazing. Yeah, it definitely goes to show how much of a family it really was there, for sure. It, it was. We had so many fathers and sons and fathers and daughters and 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 uncles and grandfathers who built the plant. I mean, you could there's one there's two pictures in the book where I show a control room operator sitting in the unit three control room in 1985. And then 30 years later, his daughter is sitting there in the same exact spot with, with an SRO license and also as a control room supervisor. So it's, it's quite amazing the, uh, the people who have gone through there. Amazing people. Yeah, that's amazing. I think if I'm remembering correctly, too, there's a picture in your book of, you know, a few family members that yes. all worked at the plant, which is very cool. Lots of family members, lots of husband, wives, um, you know, like I said, fathers, sons and, and, and grandfathers who built the plant and, and uncles who built the plant. And so many stories and so many thousands of people went through Indian Point over the years. Mm -hmm. And I know you took a lot of the pictures yourself, too, if I'm not mistaken. Do you have maybe a standout photo or two that is your favorite, if you could even choose? If I could even choose. Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. I know. Well, there, I, there's so many good ones in there. You know, my favorite part of this book is Indian Point One. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally fascinated by Indian Point One, and I was so lucky to find these pictures of Indian Point One. But I, I didn't take uh, any of those pictures. One thing, I love then and nows. So I, I was able to take these two pictures. This picture here is a Con Edison photo from 1962, uh, 1962. And I was, I couldn't wait for us to remove this concrete plug out of the floor here so I could take the same exact picture in 2020. And, and so here's, here's a picture of, of the same thing taken, you know, over 50 years apart, almost 60 years apart. And uh, so I, these are, these are kind of my favorites. I, I went through great pains to get the same exact angle and, and make it, I know my lens was probably slightly a, a different lens than the person who took this original Con Ed photo, but I did the best I could. Yeah, well, it looks like pretty identical, except for, you know, everything else that's going on in the photo. Yeah, so that's in, amazing. In the, in the original photo, the reactor vessel head is not on yet, but in this picture here from, from 2020, uh, that, the head has been on for like, you know, 50 years. Mm-hmm. And what page are those photos on for everyone who wants to grab your book and take a look? They're on pages 38 and 39. Amazing. Of, of the book. And there's lots of construction photos. And then there's another great photograph given to me uh, by a uh, former co-worker who's now retired. I talked about families. This is a, this is a family day in 1970 uh, where... Uh, Jim Mooney Sr. up here is an, an INC supervisor at, at all three units at the time. And he's taking his family through Indian Point 2 to look at the construction. And I ended up working with, with Jimmy and Mike Mooney down here, who Jim's retired and Mike is working overseas. But it's just amazing that um, he was able to find that photograph of his whole family in the airlock at Indian Point 2. Yeah, that's amazing. That's such a cool photo. <laughs> it really is. And I was so happy to to contact Jimmy and he had the uh, original. That's great, that's awesome. Well, everyone will definitely look forward to seeing those photos and many more in your book. Do you have a message that you wanna leave us off with or anything we didn't talk about that you wanted to mention? I'm just, I'm just thankful for all the people that went through that plan over the years. They really, they worked together, they made it happen and they made Indian Point successful, ran for, 59 years overall. Um, and then in the end, in, in its final run, Indian Point 3 set a world record, um, which, which is in the book. We ran for the first time ever, uh, one of the Indian Point units ran what we call breaker to breaker. So breaker to breaker is from, you leave one refueling, you refuel a reactor, you start the plant up and you go all the way to the next refueling until you have to shut the plant down. Typically there's always something happening, a maintenance outage, an unplanned or unscheduled shutdown. Uh, where something would disrupt that. So the final run of Indian Point 3, which is very fitting to all of us, was a world record run of 753 days, uh, breaker to breaker, refueling to refueling. And we are very, very proud of that. Mm -hmm. That's a great note to, I think, wrap up on. <laughs> and that was Brian, everybody. You can go ahead and get his book at anywhere he listed before. I personally ordered mine on Amazon, and I've really been enjoying looking through it. Thank you so much for coming on, Brian. It's great to Thank have you. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. Thank you. Have a great day. And initiate at least a new approach 
to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversation. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress toward peace.